Imagine Impact Associate, where they were having a discussion on breaking the illusions, leadership journey, and lessons from public office. Take a look. It continues with Cecilia Karaoke, former cabinet secretary. She's now the CEO of Reimagine Impact Associate and also a certified executive leadership and EQ coach. What does that mean, though? Which of the many? <laughs> yeah. Let's start with the certified <laughs> executive and leadership EQ coach. No, so um, perhaps just a little bit of background. So when I left the political spaces and the trenches, I came back and I needed to walk on a journey of reinvention. And I said, I've always had this passion of mentoring other leaders and sharing my experience. And I said, the best way to do it is not to come out and say, you know, I've been a minister, I've been a PS, I've been a CEO. Um, it's good for me to package in a manner that I'm able to deliver my lived experience, but importantly, bring in new concepts in leadership. And therefore, I quickly came back and enrolled for a, dip a global diploma in uh, leadership coaching. And so, you know, a couple of months down the line, I was uh, then certified as a global executive leadership coach with a diploma. But alongside that, I also thought as I was going through the motions of picking new leadership concepts, I did feel the need to interrogate and see what were my missed opportunities as a minister. What kind of leadership did I demonstrate and how would I have handled it better for even better, you know, excellent outcome? And so I quickly came across a concept of emotional intelligence and leadership and how uh, emotions drive decisions and therefore how leaders really should be emotionally intelligent, uh, let alone the technical aspects of intel. And so I quickly took a program and, and I went back uh, to school, if you will, mm -hmm. and I took a certificate um, as an EQ practitioner. So I got certified also as well. Um, emotional intelligence is about um, everything in life, so to speak. We all, you're either an accountant, you're a marketer, you're a journalist. But for you as a leader to be able to inspire teams to work optimally, there is that missing middle, which is the emotional intelligence, mm. which is about you as a leader, is saying, are you aware of your limitations and strengths? Because I've challenged leaders and I've said, especially in the political spaces, you think that you must know everything and must have all the answers. And I keep on encouraging them that you must not have all the answers. That is why you have people around you. And that is why you can go for experts to be able to come and fix the bit that you are not good at. But you go there you've seen people on camera you've seen people on tv mm. pretending they can give us solutions even for things they don't understand you appointed a minister today nobody takes you through class to understand how a minister should be here for example mm. but you come and want to lie to 50 million kenyans that indeed you have the answers you know you you think you're next to jesus you're an you're an angel and you know so um uh, emotional intelligence about telling yourself, I must not know everything. I need to keep myself around with people who know these other things, number one. Number two, I must be vulnerable enough to also say, I don't understand that. Like if I don't understand this issue, I, I mean, I really don't. Mm. And therefore, I'm looking for help. But importantly, a subject I've spoken to in emotional intelligence, when you're a leader, we miss an opportunity, especially in the public spaces, because we've been in a very command control environment do as I say, yep. I'm directing, I want that report. What that does is that you actually curtail creativity and people do only as much as they can do because they are waiting for you to give the next command and then they will, you know, answer. But when you allow them to feel empowered, valued, and you give them some reasonable safe space, they actually go out of their way and operate as if they're in the private, you know, optimal private sector companies because they feel engaged, they're empowered, they're valued, their opinions matter and therefore emotional intelligence about the awareness of you as a leader the self-awareness is also about the awareness of people around you and the teams that you're leading and how you're able to engage inspire them and get them going it's also about uh, combining um your weaknesses their limitations or your limitations their weaknesses bringing in technical data into any decision that you make we call that emotional reasoning among other competencies so i went and i um, I'm very privileged that I took the time to be able to go deep and understand this because anytime I engage with leaders, including the political leaders, mm. this is kind of the competences and skill set that I'm encouraging them to develop. Beauty is that they are easy to develop if you really want to change behavior. But if you think what you're doing is the right thing, then you'll come and shout at us 
and go home in the evening, as opposed to coming and being empathetic and saying, you know, what are Kenyans going through today? Mm. Um, yeah. High cost of living. Mm. How? Is there any hope? Are you people being arrogant around how you are resolving? Or we can go and take tissue and hang ourselves up? Or, you know, are you being empathetic as you engage with the population? So that, that is what it is about now. The executive leadership coaching, the other component, is really about helping you as a leader at whatever level mm. to believe, one, in yourself that you have the solutions in yourself um, and that my role as a coach is to help you to discover that is which, uh, that which is within you and to be able to get it out as you make decisions and execute, as opposed to me mentoring you and telling you, no, you know, when I was a minister of um, this and the other, mm -hmm. this is how I approach this, and therefore you need to go and approach it the same way, because then I'm limiting you to my failures yeah. or what it is I didn't get right. Mm -hmm. But when I am your coach, I indeed partner with you, and through powerful questioning, you are able to like, um, hmm, I hadn't thought about it that way, kind mm. of thing. Uh -huh. I'll try that. So that it is really you discovering, building the confidence, and doing it. Fail ones, that's all right. Get up and say, uh -huh. what if I try this other way? Yeah. Now, you come to me as your coach and interrogate your thoughts. You bounce back your thoughts in terms of the approach you want to take. And I'll be able to encourage you, you know, you could try one, two, three, but I don't have the recipe. I don't have the answers as your coach. You have them, but I give you a safe, safe space to be able to come and see. I'm working with several, a couple of uh, ministers uh, away from Kenya. Mm. I must be very quick to say that. <laughs> I'm working with a couple of leaders from, away from Kenya, a few from Kenya at mm. the executive level. And it's amazing how they are able to discover very obvious things but because they didn't allow themselves some safe space to reflect mm. introspection mm. with an expert who nudges them on, mm. they'll come back and say, I, I don't believe it. I mean, delegating to my teams was my biggest headache. I always continued being a medical doctor. Mm. Never mind, I had been given the role of now leading a department. Mm. It, 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 it looks so easy, but I never thought about it that way. Is so it? that is a work that I do most of the time these days. When you, with the knowledge you now have, and you introspect, what could you have done better? I'd have empowered teams in the public sector more than I did. Mm -hmm. um, and I did discover the difference between me running the Ministry of, say, Health, and the way I run the Ministry of Water. Mm. Because at that point, the discovery was already had already started evolving in me that empowering teams, actually, they get it done in shorter time. You have better relationships, and therefore more inspired, more motivated. And you achieve more. I achieved a lot more, that I must say. Is this perhaps what began the journey of the book you then went to write? Your memoirs, so to speak. Um, no, really, my my book was inspired by worse things. <laughs> <laughs> Is it um, possible to mention some of these worse things so that we get an insight into some of the, uh, the, 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 the trials and tribulations that people <laughs> who are in high political offices have to go through? Um, I'll share three. Please. Um, one... Um, Health is a very controversial <laughs> sport mm. in terms of the interest. And they are deep. And nobody should lie to you, they are not there. They are deep, they are, you know, ime pandwa. Mm. You know, it's grown. Deep rooted, it has, matured for over many years. It even has grandchildren right, right there. So I moved in with an agenda to reform. And that was always my brief. Mm. Um, anywhere I went, it was an issue of reform. My tea sector days go in there, look at the legal framework and, you know, turn it upside down. But health was the most interesting because I moved there and I took my usual energy to reform. And therefore it was universal health coverage needed to be delivered in a manner that was sustainable. Uh, NHIF needed to be turned upside down. There were bad manners happening there. There was a lot of seepage. Uh, KEMSA, uh, you know, Kenya Medical Supplies, again, another notorious place in terms of interest because they are huge budgets. Mm. Those two institutions, including the ministry headquarters itself, needed to be reformed. And so 
I did touch the live wire because I, I went right direct. And my first in incident was recruiting or redirecting commencement of the recruitment process of the CEO of KEMSA. There was already one and there was an interest of others who had run around and lobbied. And so I had a list eight months later, pick one of these. And I wasn't going to do that. So I said, cancel process, get started. I touched live wire. And on this particular day when the advert ran, the re-advert ran, I received interesting calls from sources I won't, <laughs> I won't speak about. Mm. Mm -hmm. I even received visitors in the guise of taking coffee in my office. And they said, mm-hmm, so what happened? Why did you get started with this process? Little did I know that that was going to be the entry point of my impeachment attempt, right. which almost sailed through. Mm. But within the same time, there was a lot of notorious happenings at Kenyatta National Hospital, given it is a premier referral hospital. Mm. It felt very bad that there were allegations of parents, mothers being raped within the hospital. It was ugly that there was one surgery which I have documented and written about where you go to hospital with a stomach cake, you admit it. Um, Muga comes with um, a head issue mm. and is operated in the stomach and vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? You know? <laughs> and it was drama mm. and that needed to be resolved. And so I did get to the board and I said, you know what? I don't even know about this evening or tomorrow. I want this resolved with you now. And I drove there. And um, it earned a sus suspension of the then CEO mm. to allow for investigation because the noises were too many. Yeah. And there were noises which had started before I came in. Um, when the former minister handed over to me, said, I have ordered for investigation into this facility and therefore follow through. So already there were problems. Now, I received interesting calls. Immediately, these went on air. 411, I received calls. And I remember one very conspicuous. And they said, you know, we trusted you to be a good leader, but I think we are use you are useless. You know, wow. you know and, and these are the things we get exposed to, right? Mm. This is a politician. Mm. Um, and of course, uh, the rest is history because she proceeded. Uh, we did proper investigation, proper auditing there. And we think, I think at that point, I did put the institution on the right footing. As an outcome, then Sicily has to be impeached. In my book, I say I was being impeached for doing the right thing. Because today, if I get the same opportunity, I'll do exactly that, I think, with better speed. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so that is one of the things that inspired me to write because I said then, I'm up against all these people. They are refusing to actually even commend me for attempting to do an, a very untidy job. And the prize I'm getting is being impeached. Mm. It went to the third reading, 170 MP signed, passed the threshold, went to the third reading, pulled out on the afternoon, I still remember, on a Thursday. Um, the second one that caused me to write was a second attempted impeachment. This had to do with the NYS alleged, second alleged scandal, mm. for which I am not the accounting officer. I never was. I had served my days as an accounting officer when I was a PS. But it all boiled down to politics that were being interpreted in the manner of mutuetu. Mm. You know, kind of conversation. So I, I became a victim. I, I said, one day I'll tell my story and I won't tell it the way I'm saying. I will document mm. so that my grandchildren can also read. The second motivation that I had for writing the book was every time I appeared to be a little bit head on with issues, I challenged the status quo. Um, I reformed a sector and withheld licenses from politicians who were correct, who had gotten their licenses not in the correct way. And I withheld. Uh, you know, I called back, I cancelled. Um, the story would go look at her. She can't be this daring if she's not connected. Mm. This is a relative of the third president. Don't touch her. You know, and I carried that story all the time. Mm. Oh, she comes, she was born in Embuya. Oh, she's from that rich family. Mm. Uh, that is why she happened to be in that position. My father, my mother, very humble. Very humble, without shoes to school, like most of you. So I decided to use the opportunity to flip 
this false perception about who I am and ride on it and do the reforms and turn back without confirming whether I'm a relative of the third president. Because when I came to be appointed <laughs> in cabinet, uh, and it so happened there were 26 PSs, and I was the only one who was lucky to go to be promoted to cabinet. Mm. They said, look, did we not tell you? She's a relative of the Kenyatta's. Do, 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 don't you understand? There's a connection, <laughs> Bona. <laughs> Isn't it? Because this is how we view things. Mm. So I decided I'll tell my story so that the facts can be no known that I am from the most humble family. Really. Struggled mm. through even to get food and school fees. I've been sent out of school without school because of school, lack of school fees. I'll tell my story that I'm not related to either the third or the fourth president. I'll also tell the story that I did need to bribe my way to get to the places where I have gotten. Mm. And so those are some of the things that motivated me to write. You did or you didn't? I didn't. Okay. My friend, <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> I you'll, didn't. You'll be related to the fourth hey, governor. Yes. Don't worry, we'll find a relative. <laughs> if you miss the other, we'll find you one. I'm my own relative. Yeah. <laughs> These experiences, though, they point towards something that there are people who are in public service who are in that sector who mean to do well from your experience as a ps and as a cs for those many years could you say without naming names there are people who actually get into this office with no intention to deliver let's start with from president to deputy president to ministers to PSs. I mean, the four of us in this room today are different, isn't it? We yeah. are driven by different reasons. Our motivations are quite different. Mm. So I do believe, using my own case, is that yeah, there are people who just want to do a good job. Um, and there are those who not necessarily, um, you know, to do a good job, but are out there for self-interest. Um, and that's why we are different. Self-service um, in the public sector is high, and so is humility to actually make a difference and, and so it's a balance and it, it's really what drives you what motivates you they say the fish rots from the head that's a proverb mm. yes it's documented so when we see such problems <laughs> where, where do we trace the problem in my days my brief every time i went to a new docket and and um N nys was troubled really because when i moved in it was nys one mm. saga, uh, public confidence down south, um, the former minister called off and she had to resign. It was very troubled and, and it gave me jitters. My brief then from my boss was, don't touch, no nothing. There's a lot of money, there's a big budget in that ministry, it's not your money. So I worked all the time knowing public money is not my money. But when the boss also tells you as much, then you confirm it's really not my money. And so every day I had, every time I had a meeting with my management team, I was on record, like a broken record, that it's not our money. And therefore you get caught, you're on your own. You're on your own. Yes, just like the boss has told me. Could you also translate it the way that uh, Ed and Wally has said, <laughs> it's, it's not yours, it's not your mother's money. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I can only speak about me, uh, you know, because again, also tongue sleep. When I was in the Ministry of Health, I defended public resources until mm. they decided she's behaving like that child. You know, mm. so the, I got the name and I was glad that that was a name attributed to me because clearly you have to defend public money as if it's yours. Because in the end of the day, from the proverb that uh, Muga has shared, it's about us and the relationship. I'm only privileged, 22 of us, to serve 50 million Kenyans. Mm. So if I come and pretend it's, I have to defend it like it's my money. It's just good manners. Is that happening? Not necessarily. So are those the things that made us, for example, not move ahead with UHC, for instance? You rolled out the UHC mm -hmm. pilot project mm -hmm. in those four counties. It's Yolo, Kisumu, Nyeri, Machakos. Mm -hmm. We never saw a report, Cecily. In fact, we kept talking about this here mm -hmm. and saying, Cecily, can you, can you just give us a report? Mm -hmm. What happened to the pilot UHC? Mm -hmm. I'm surprised you didn't see the report. Mm -hmm. There was an in-depth detailed report, uh -huh. documented, researched, which is part of what was informing the scale-up. What affected the scale-up 
please get me on record, okay. was COVID came in and resources were diverted to manage uh, or to mitigate against COVID. That is the time I was living. Mm. So really there was a report. Of course, I have the summary briefs with me, but you see, I'm not the Minister for Health, mm. so I can't start sharing that, but there was. And trust me, um, Latif, I don't think that I'm one person who would settle to allow for a four billion investment to go undocumented with good lessons learned, mm -hmm. with missed opportunities, and the way forward. So that report is there. Did you ever come up to the public? Because you came to the public and said, you know, we are rolling out UHC in yes. these four counties and giving us the progress and telling us this UHC is rolling out. Did you ever come out to tell us, so this here is, is the found, report? Yeah. Because you had a report, mm. yes. But did you tell us? I did. I did. Uh -huh. I do recall must have been in Pan Africa or something with mm. the Committee of Health then, mm. because we were looking at scaling up only on the basis of anchoring the UHC modalities on a policy. Yeah. And therefore, there was a policy that I took to cabinet, uh, which later on was um, revised by the CS who took over from me. And it was stable, and it's public. I mean, that information is relative. Really, it's there, it's public information. Mm. Yeah. There's something that has always puzzled me when I look at just the number of, I'm looking at it now, parastatal semi-autonomous government agencies, regulatory bodies, councils, all of the ministry. There are many. Yes. Now, something that has dominated our conversations recently is appointments of people to such bodies and such boards. Tell us a little bit about your experience in these matters, because as a politician, mm -hmm. these things count. They do. Yes. I mean, they do. Um, in, in, uh, I'm looking at about uh, 16 of them in my days in water. I'm looking at 26 plus in my days in health. And... Um, you know, truth be told, these are some of the instruments that are used uh, to promote political expediency. Now, some of them, mm. I said. Mm. In some cases like health, mm. the law was so very clear of either the caliber, the qualifications on the person that can come onto these boards. And therefore that gives you a safeguard because then you don't just pick a failed politician to come and join such a board. Mm. But on a balance, there are those that look like uh, kawaida, you know, ordinary, anybody can come and fit in. Mm. And some of them have been used, uh, like uh, you and I know, to reward. Now, in a lot of cases, the appointing authority for the chairman of the boards and parastatals, the appointing authority is the president in a lot of cases, the of the top. What about the CEOs? Um, Recruited by the board. Mm. The, recruited by the board with the concurrence of the minister mm. and in consultation with the head of state where there's good order. Mm -hmm. <laughs> where there's good order. Yeah? But in my days, I, I really must say, and maybe it is part of what turned me the impeachment motions, I, I was given the latitude to actually manage the process mm. in a lot of cases, or in most cases, I must say. Mm. But when it comes to, and again, I must say my tenure may have been a bit different because had I started with the 2023, uh, sorry, 2013, when the government had just come in, maybe there were rewards to be made at that point in time, but I was only a PS, so I wasn't quite involved. Agriculture, when I was a PS also, is very predetermined in terms of the qualifications of who can get in, which again gives a safeguard. Mm. As we come to your conclusion, I want to ask you, because you're now outside and you're looking, just, you're seeing things that are happening. Mm -hmm. Your former boss is now president mm -hmm. and some of your colleagues are advising him. Yes. Where are we heading? That's a very broad question. Where are we Deliberately heading? so, madam. Yes. yes. Okay. Are they making the right decisions <laughs> for this country? That's a very direct question. <laughs> <laughs> you asked for um, it. You have a minute. <laughs> You really want me to answer that? Yes. yes. Um, if we were making the right decisions at that point, I think that the noise would be less. That's my very direct answer. Mm. Yes. The noises at the village level would be less. And right now they're very loud. At the village level, um, it's loud. Okay. I mean, where I am, it's loud. There's a lot of hopelessness setting in. There's a lot of, um, are we going to recover? There's despair. Yeah. Do you think if you are making the right decisions when you were in government mm -hmm. with your bosses then, mm -hmm. 
the people would have rejected your party the way they did in the last election? Rather the, your president then the way mm. they did. Uh, you know, the electorate is very interesting because they get carried away with emotions. And I told you, emotions inform decisions. Mm. Um, politics is emotions put together. Mm. And therefore, I want to think and confirm from the docket that I was responsible personally mm. that we moved. Mm. We moved. Did you get everything right? Spice up your life. Here is like uh, even the some of the counties where we come from. It's like we've seen you, Latif. We know what you're capable of delivering. Ah, move on. Get, get, let, let the other person come. Else. Very emotional. So okay. the public also needs to decide whether they are going to vote me in because I speak good English mm. or good Kiswahili, whether I am light color you know they must decide what they are voting mm. whether i go to dance with them i dance a lot with the youth and the women mm. whether because i dance with them i was going to be able to deliver when they removed the vote for uhuru tano uh, tena mm. so the the public must also decide what it is they want now do, does the media have a role in that a huge one because you also are the people who are branding people in terms of who they are and what it is and <laughs> in my book i have talked about the Calling media your and you know and such you know, mm. and funding it. Mm. And, and you know, when I come to tell you this is the truth about Sicily, mm. you are just funding the Sicily who has been brought by people who are impeaching me. So I've spoken to the media, I've dedicated a paragraph to the media, that the, me the media can be used by politicians or business adversaries if you are not careful. Mm. Because also the journalist, in terms of doing proper research, you know who Sicily is, the work she does on a day-to-day -day basis, mm. the impact of the difference she's bringing, the media also is as guilty as the population. Latif? Not always. Sorry. D don't. May, no, 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 no. I get it. <laughs> I, I, I am not, I'm not pushing back on that. I completely get it and I agree. Yeah. So in your own assessment and judgment, the decisions that the people make in an election are not based on, on pragmatism. They are not made on anything practical. They are purely emotional. Um, 80 or to percent a, to a greater extent they're emotional 80 percent it is a person who comes with lot money to come and dish out and throw out mm. right mm. i will decide this guy is my guy is rich it is how you carry yourself and engage a ground it is the arm twisting that you do it is just the need i want you off that seat let me get the next person we must get to a point and interrogate people for who they are where have you been what have you delivered what can you be held accountable for? But we have even thieves. And you know, this guy is, or that woman is really a thief, mm -hmm. documented with a case in court. But you've decided this is the one I want. Eh? And in one county, I remember hearing, yeah. So, you know, so come on, 50 million Kenyans, get your leaders and hold them accountable. You get people who have not, I'm not saying going to school is a huge thing, but you get people who, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. <laughs>